a wireless video scanner, and I want to show you something that's pretty cool. So let me hit record real quick. So we got plain static, and now I'm going to look for devices. And you can hear the Bluetooth scanning. And now it's stopped. I'll hit scan one more time. And you'll also notice that on your screen you'll get a whole bunch of horizontal lines. These horizontal lines are actually the video scanner trying to pick up as video the digital data of the Bluetooth. Now, Bluetooth, on average, will not break more than 2 milliwatts of output power. There are three classes of Bluetooth. Uh, class 1, 2, and 3 uh, is either 1 watt, 5 watt, or 10, sorry, 1, mil uh, 1 milliwatt, 3 milliwatt, or 10 milliwatts. So when you're buying a Bluetooth dongle to mod, uh, try to go and get a class 1 device as it will have the highest power output. And also try to look for something with a CSR radio chipset, or the Cambridge Silicon Radio. Reason being is, their radio chipset really kicks ass. It's the Blue Core Bluetooth chipset, and it's highly hackable and highly moddable. As for antennas with the Bluetooth, waveguides are really nice. I actually built this one uh, in an earlier segment, where the Bluetooth is directly hardwired into the waveguide. It's relatively portable. Normally what I'll do is I'll fold the legs to the tripod back, and I'll throw this in my backpack right over my shoulder and I'll just leave my laptop scanning in my backpack. Uh, or you can actually hold it like so and scan. When you go out and scan, uh, location, location, location. The best places to go and scan are where there are the most people. Busy intersections, places where there's a lot of traffic, highway overpasses, coffee shops, uh, train stations, uh, Grand Central Station or Penn, Pennsylvania Station or Union Square here in New York City are some of the hot spots that we like to go and scan. Every once in a while we'll go to a coffee house where there's a, a four-way, six-lane in each direction street where there's a lot of traffic and around rush hour people will actually uh, have a lot of bottlenecking in, in the cross sections and people are sitting with their Bluetooth headsets and their Bluetooth phones and even their Bluetooth cars and you can use things like Red Fang, Car Whisperer, or even just BT Scanner while sitting on the corner at a local shop sipping a cup of coffee or whatever you like to drink. And um, that's about that. I really wouldn't go as far as hooking up a helical antenna to a Bluetooth device as they're just too bulky and Bluetooth devices tend to be relatively small. Now there is a lot of relative naughtiness that you can do with Bluetooth devices, especially with hands-free headsets. And using the CSR chipset, uh, there are utilities that you can use to actually do packet sniffing under Bluetooth, but that's still something I'm trying to learn myself. I've been studying the Bluetooth protocol quite a bit, and it's very, relatively difficult, but it's really fun once you actually get a hold of it. So uh, the next runner-up is Wi-Fi, and I left this for last because there's actually a lot to say about this. Now, when it comes to Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi typically has 11 channels in the United States, 14 in the UK, and I think Japan. Now, again, my personal favorite antenna for Wi-Fi is the Biquad. Helical antennas are really awesome for long-range shootouts. And the thing is, you got to keep them short. You can't make them as long. You can only maybe make about 3.5 decibel gain helical antennas if you want to put it on the end of a dish. I do believe, now correct me if I'm wrong, the longest Wi-Fi shootout was almost 225 miles. First was about 190, but the team that, uh, I think either the same team or another team, went out and actually made a two, almost a 250 mile uh, link using over-the-counter equipment. Really, nothing but laptops, satellite dishes, a couple of helical antennas, and some Wi-Fi cards, over-the-counter stuff. Now, when you're scanning for Wi-Fi, uh, the thing with NetStumbler, it's a great program. However, it's really not that good if you just want to get a signal report. NetStumbler was designed for war driving, and kudos to the creator for, for NetStumbler. I've had many years of fun with it. However, it has not been updated in years, so a lot of modern cards will not work with NetStumbler. And according from what I've seen uh, on the developer's blog and on the forums, they have no intent in updating it whatsoever. There is little to no Vista support at all, and there's no intentions in getting Vista to work uh, with NetStumbler. So, NetStumbler is cool for war driving. Is there a better application? 
Maybe. There's Kismet. Now, Kismet runs on Linux. Kismac, if you're running OS X. There are also other applications for war driving and wireless scanning, which I'll put on the forums, but I'm not much of a Mac person, so I can't help you there. So I'll get some advice from everyone else. So NetStumbler is really cool. Unfortunately, trying to navigate through NetStumbler while holding a laptop in one hand with a touchpad isn't really the best to get signal reports. Kismet, for Linux, doesn't really give you the actual signal strength reports. It doesn't give you a chart. So Kismet versus NetStumbler, what's better? Really, my opinion, the right tool for the right job. If you want to go war driving, Kismet, NetStumbler, NetStone is what we call an active scanner. It'll actively ping. It'll transmit and say, hey, any Wi-Fi out there? Which is bad, because anyone with common sense can detect NetStumbler. In fact, Kismet can actually detect NetStumbler. So when I'm running Kismet and someone's word driving around my neighborhood, it actually says someone with NetStumbler is trying to ping your network. So Kismet's a passive scanner, but getting it to work under Linux, you have to have some Linux savvy. I mean, myself, I can get it working these days, but three years ago it was a real pain in the ass. So if you can get, if you get Backtrack 2 or 3 with a compatible Wi-Fi card, that's great. Now, we've actually modified the Linksys WUSB 54G cards on the show. They're really great cards. In fact, I'm selling them pre-modded with bike quads and cables and stuff. And I honestly didn't think people would actually give a crap until I got more and more requests for them. What's really cool about this card is it's Linux compatible, OS X compatible, Vista compatible, XP compatible. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with NetStumbler because the driver database hasn't been updated in three years. So even though you have a Wi-Fi card, even if it's brand new and kick ass, it might not work with NetStumbler because it's just an old program. Albeit it's great, it's obsolete. A better program, if you just really need to get signal reports and really not do war driving, is Insider. Insider is actually made by May Geek, the same company that created uh, uh, the Y-Spot, and it'll actually give you a live bar graph, or sorry, a live line graph display of all of the active wireless activity in the area. It's not the fastest in the world, it has absolutely no war driving capabilities whatsoever, but it will work with any card that is either Windows XP or Vista compatible. So. If you really just want to do signal reports, which is something I like to do a lot, I really don't care about actually mapping the area. Um, I really care more about trying to figure out where the actual access points are coming from. I'll use Insider over NetStumbler, mainly for ease of use and the fact that it actually works with my hardware. Now, you can also get PCMCA cards, but trying to get PCMCA cards that work under Linux can not only be tedious, but it's a roll of the dice. Uh, if you want to get something under Linux, you got to make sure that the chipset inside of the actual circuitry is supported under Linux. These days, it's relatively easy. Unfortunately, if you're completely new to Linux, the chances of you getting a supported Wi-Fi card out of the box from your local retail store, you might as well just go and smash yourself in the side of the head with a ball-peen hammer to try to get it to work. Really, you have to know intimate details about your hardware. Now, when you're doing wire, uh, Wi-Fi scanning, you have to understand that in some states, this equipment in some countries. Uh, I know they have some really strict laws out in the Germany and UK now. Some of this equipment could be illegal. Um, I know in some states, just possession of a waveguide or a cantenna will actually get you a weekend in jail just for having it. It's considered conspiracy to commit uh, computer fraud or wiretapping or, or whatever. So check your local laws. Now, um, there is a lot more to this. I really don't know what I'm forgetting besides what antennas to use under Wi-Fi. If you're war driving and you want to have an omnidirectional field of view, I'd definitely go with the compact collinear. Um, I actually have some, some of these suction cup clamps. They're pretty cool. Um, they're literally clamps that have suction cups on them, and they fit onto the, uh, onto the compact collinear perfectly. So I can actually put this suction cupped to the side of the window of a vehicle, or even a moving train if so need be, and then wire this directly into my Wi-Fi card to go and get a signal report. Now, again, the bi-quad is my favorite of all antennas, but you might want to fool around with the waveguide on, wave on this one. Unfortunately, I found that trying to build a waveguide can be a fairly difficult thing to do because not too many people have the skill to drill a hole in a round surface. Again, the bi-quad is a really fun antenna. Now, if you really want, like I said, if you want to do really long-range shootouts, use two helical antennas that are polarized in the same direction, either left, uh, left-hand coil or right-hand coil. Uh, the actual 
uh, driven element, the actual receiving spiral of wire. Uh, watch the segment and you'll understand. Uh, reason being is, instead of being horizontally or vertically polarized, it's circular polarized in the exact same phase no matter what. So you don't have to worry about the signal actually reflecting or, or bouncing off of anything. And because only those two signals on that frequency actually are rotating in the same direction, they'll really only want to see each other rather than everything around them. Now, uh, the Wi-Fi channels do actually overlap. Now, I would highly recommend if you're going to install any kind of Wi-Fi device, at least run Insider, NetStumbler, Kismet, or Kismac, or even get your PDA or your MDA and scan for local Wi-Fi access points just to see what's in the local area. Walk around the block a couple of times. There are some really cool applications for the Pocket PC, as well as the uh, Linux uh, handheld devices and the MDA and things of the such. I'll put into the show notes. We've really covered this in the past, though. And get a site survey of what's going on in your area and make sure you're not operating on a channel that is actually in use or even being overlapped with another frequency. I'll actually put up a, a chart of the Wi-Fi frequency so you have a better idea. I'll also put it in the show notes, the exact same graphic I'll be using. So these are just some of the tips and techniques. Um, whenever you're dealing with any kind of these devices, you've got to make sure that you always have enough battery power because the last thing you want to do is have a battery malfunction out in the field. You go out to... Uh, what you'd think to be a very uh, wonderful day of scanning for Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and wireless video just to find out that when you get to the area that you want to scan, you wind up running out of battery power or your batteries are not holding a charge properly. And I was hoping by now we would actually do another physical hacking segment, but time and weather and health have been preventing a lot of us from getting together and doing it. But remember what I've said in episode one. This is why I said what, what I said in episode one, Mustang and I covered dressing elite. You don't want to go into a shitty neighborhood or even a good neighborhood at 2 o'clock in the morning carrying this kind of equipment around by yourself. It doesn't matter how good or how rich hoity-toity upper class your neighborhood is. The bottom line is there might be someone lurking in the shadows waiting to go and put a knife in your gut to go and take your stuff. And that's the bottom line. So I hope this is it. I'm going to try to composite what I can together. I know I'm forgetting a lot. There's just a, really a lot to cover with this, but really, go out and about and experiment. That's what this is all about. Just remember, go out, be safe, go out as a group, go out often, and stay in public areas. I guarantee you that you'll find a lot of fun stuff in the 2.4 gigahertz field, and I really hope this series of segments have enlightened you and, and, and entertained you and educated you in getting involved in not only just 2.4 gigahertz wireless, but wireless in general, because coming up soon, we're getting into amateur radio and some other cool shit. So if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to add anything to this, even if you want to do your own little tutorial video, that uh, including your own experiences, maybe do some kind of blog or whatever, hit me up on IRC. Show notes are always on the forums. Forums are always open for discussion, as well as IRC. Let us know your adventures out in the wireless world. We want to hear them. All right, everyone. Good luck. Have fun. Be safe.